Today's episode is episode 155, and today's episode is called Bliss Brain. Today I'm joined by Dawson Church. Dawson is a writer. He is somebody who's been in the field of epigenetics, healing, energy work. He's written numerous books, including today's book, Bliss Brain, his most latest book. He's written a book called Mind to Matter, The Genie in Your Genes, which it talks around epigenetics. So on today's episode, we explore a lot of different things. Meditation came up. I know that Dawson does EFT tapping. Eco meditation is his form of meditation, which in his own words is for people who fail at meditation. So we explore a little bit about that today. And yeah, we just talk about meditation from a neuroscience point of view, how it's beneficial. Talk a little bit about non-local mind, tapping into non-local mind. What is non-local mind? And we talked a little bit around flow, getting into that flow state where your skill level is just at... So you're, you're finding the edge there between working on something that's just a little bit above your current skill level so that you're improving. It's deliberate practice, but it's in a state of flow where you're not taking off too much than you can chew too much of a mountain, finding that balance there. So yeah, I enjoyed talking to Dawson, provided, provided a lot of different insights. I enjoyed reading the book, it's a very detailed book. There's been a lot of research that went into it, I can tell from, from reading it, a lot of life experiences. And yeah, that's it. I hope you enjoyed today's episode and thanks again for listening. Okay, so thanks for joining us today, Dawson. It's a pleasure to be here, Dennis. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. So my first question is, who are you and what are you doing in the world today? <laughs> Dennis, I'm what we all are. I'm a being of infinite love, wisdom, and light in a human body. <laughs> and what the human body is doing today, you know, we're all doing different things every day in our lives. And uh, we have our jobs as a butcher, a baker, a candlestick maker, or whatever it is we do, do for a living. But if we can live our lives from that perspective of who we really are, because who we really are is this um, remarkable selfhood, this, 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 this being one with the universe. If we can live and, and bring that into our daily lives, it transforms the daily lives. So I'm, I'm writing, I'm meditating, I'm, um, I'm educating people, I'm working on various online programs. And so there's all this day-to-day -day stuff. But the key thing that is, is to remember every day, tune into that great non-local reality field and realize that's who I really am. Yeah, you, you, you're doing a lot of stuff. Yeah. It's, uh, what I'm curious about, though, is, is when you start getting interested in the self and getting an awareness of the non-local mind to begin with, looking back in your own life. Tragedy, disappointment, loss, depression, PTSD. I tell the story in my book, This Frame, about how when I was 15 years old, I was just, I was so miserable. I was so depressed. I had no friends, people didn't want to be around me. People just avoided me. I was just so, I just like this cloud of toxic depression hanging around me. And I, 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 I had this day, I was 15 years old and I happened to walk past a full length mirror and I stared at myself. And I had these, had this hippie shirt on and bell bottom jeans and a bag of books on my shoulder and long hair. And I, looked at myself and I stared into my own eyes and <clears throat> these words flashed in my head and said, that's the saddest face I've ever seen. And I realized I had, a, I had to fix myself. So I was just, I, I spent years in despair. I was suicidal then. And I, I, I went and lived on a spiritual community. I studied psychology. I tried through spirituality and psychology, meditation, mindfulness. I tried to improve. I improved a little bit. But then in the early 2000s, I came across the, well, first of all, I made a commitment when I turned 45 years old to meditate every single day. And that's when my whole life began to change radically within about a year. And then I discovered energy therapies, energy medicine, energy psychology, and they start to shift your psyche. And the exciting new research in this brain shows they're shifting your brain. Like one guy whose story I tell, his name is Graham Phillips, is a TV reporter, and he began a mindfulness course. But before he did the mindfulness course, he went into a TV, into a, into a lab with his TV camera crew, and they videotaped him taking all of these tests, and he got into an advanced MRI scanner measuring the volume of every single 
neurological area of his brain. And he then began to learn mindfulness over the next eight weeks. And when they came back to the lab after eight weeks and remeasured his brain, parts of his brain had rewired so fast that they had grown by two or three or 4% in only two months. But one part of his brain, a little tiny bit of tissue about the size of my little fingernail over here in the middle of his brain that has tentacles and governs emotional regulation all over the brain. So you don't get angry or annoyed or upset or triggered as easily. And that part of his brain in eight weeks had grown by 22.8%. So when you use these practices that I, I discovered when I turned 45 and began to meditate every day and then energy therapies and mindfulness, your brain starts to change radically and quickly. And then you become a whole different person. So that really was a big turning point. And it all began with despair and trying to figure out how to fix my own really unhappy brain. Yeah, you mentioned the book that you struggled with meditation initially. How did you, what changed for you? How did you get into the habit of meditation so easily <laughs> then later on in life? Dennis, I struggled with meditation this morning. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I've been teaching this stuff for years and years and years, and I still struggle with it every day. And it's mostly monkey mind. And my mind is just as active as anyone else's mind. And so I try to find ways of doing meditation that don't require you to still the mind. And I'm, I mean, my, my hat is off to like, there are Tibetan monks who we put them in an MRI, look at their brain waves and their minds are genuinely still. <laughs> I can't do that after decades of practice. I, I still have this just utterly unruly mind. So I began to find hacks and workarounds to try and induce a meditative state without stilling the mind. And that's what I've now bundled over the last 15 years or so into what's called eco-meditation. And you just sit in a certain way, a certain posture, breathe in a certain rhythm. You visualize certain things, relax certain muscles. And when you do these things, you're mimicking the physiology of a master meditator. And when you do that, you drop into their psychology very, very quickly. So we just finished a randomized controlled trial of 24 people. Half of them were in a control group, 12 in a control group, 12 in an active group doing eco meditation. And the control group did mindful breathing. So a very, very similar kind of routine. But in the one month that they practiced, the group doing mindful breathing had no change in their brains. The group doing eco meditation in only four weeks and only 22 minutes a day, not very long. So 20 minutes a day for 28 days. And the group in the eco meditation condition doing that meditation for that 22 minutes every day, their brains changed radically in two areas. One of those is called the mid prefrontal cortex. And we have our prefrontal cortex in the front of our brains behind our temples over here. And the mid prefrontal cortex is right over here. And it's associated with thinking about yourself, being self-centered, being narcissistic, being self-reflective, my life, my body, my clothes, my blah, 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 whatever it is. So that's the my, me, I show. And that part of the brain in these people in the study just went dark, it just turned off. Also the right thinking brain, the, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, the part of the brain that is the biggest thinker and controller in the brain, that part of the brain went off as well. So they weren't thinking, they were just drifting. And then one part turned on. And it was just beautiful to look at the brain scans of these people and the aggregate brain scan and their empathy and compassion circuit was lit up like a Christmas tree. And so what happened, they did this for a month and when you use it, you change it. It's like working out your biceps for a month. Those biceps began to grow. So they had functional connectivity changes in their brains and their brain anatomy began to grow. They had more tissue then in that compassion network and a quiet network that had to do with being self-centered and suffering. So these kinds of techniques are really simple. I have a hard time with mind wandering, but you can learn to just do these simple physical cues, like relaxing certain muscles, breathing a certain way, and you get to this elevated state of connection with the universe and you feel absolutely wonderful. That's why the book is called Bliss Brain. 
What's the difference between eco meditation and uh, other meditations? What's the how would you say is the distinct difference? I guess eco meditation assumes you're a failed, an utter abject failure at meditation, just like me. <laughs> it does take the pressure off. <laughs> Its starting point is that you've flopped at every meditation course you've ever taken or book you've ever read or teacher you've ever studied with just like I did. And you need something that is bulletproof. And so like just one of the instructions is breathe six seconds in and six seconds out. Now, there are a lot of fancy ways to induce what's called heart coherence when you have your heart in this coherent rhythm. But if you just breathe six seconds in and six seconds out, you get into heart coherence. Then... Another instruction is feel a sense of connection in your heart with a source of unconditional love. That puts you in deep heart coherence. Then you relax a certain muscle in your jaw that sends a signal to your sympathetic nervous system, your fight and flight system to calm down and dials up your rest and digest system. So it dials down stress, dials up the relaxation circuit. You just do these physical things, even though your mind might still be busy or active, you are into this very, very deep meditative state. So that's that's the big difference. It's, it's physiological cues. It's not psychological, it's not spiritual. You don't believe in a guru, you don't wear saffron robes, you don't shave your head, you don't mm. have to become a vegetarian, you don't have to give up tea, coffee. I, I remember, Funny thing, Dennis. One one meditation teacher. I was, I was uh, at a, a big. I, I read his work. I, I loved his writing, so I went to see him. And there was a big hall with about five hundred people, and he was giving this lecture. And the guy was so inspiring. So after reading his work and about about hearing his lecture, he then just was giving us this beautiful picture of the, of a spiritual enlightenment and state. And so I was like, Yeah, I'm in. And then he began to talk about the things you have to give up. Tea, oh, uh, coffee, oh, uh, whiskey, wine, beer. Uh, and even like a lot of his followers are married and they're celibate in their marriages. It's like, my heart just sank. It's like, I can't do any of that stuff. <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not gonna give up, give up all that stuff. I'm gonna just have a regular normal life, like a regular normal person. So in the olden days, you know, a hundred thousand years ago, old meditation practices, you went away to the monastery, you became a celibate, you became a renunciate, you gave up all of this stuff. And that's what made you holy, that's what made you able to reach those elevated states. Now, we're hearing about people, I mean, I have a report recently from somebody who was in prison, and they're doing this in prison. And suddenly, they're changing. This, this guy, in prison, was actually on, on death row for killing somebody, and he killed his wife's lover. He found his wife in bed with another man. He killed the guy. And to him, it was just like, you know, if somebody says a disrespectful word in the prison yard, I'm going to hit him. It's just like, he said that word to me, I'm going to hit him. Just like cause and effect. He began to use these techniques. He had to meditate and relax. And suddenly the guy says a disrespectful word, and he realizes he has a choice. I don't have to hit him. I can breathe, I can center myself, I can let go. So it's now not just in the monastery, it's being used to treat veterans with PTSD, it's in hospitals, it's in psychotherapy offices, it's in sports big time. I mean, in the last Olympics, many of the people were used, they were using mindfulness, meditation, EFT, acupressure tapping, one of these kinds of techniques in the book that really shift your awareness and then shift your performance. High performance, high stress executives, teachers in school rooms and kids in school rooms, all of these groups are now using these methods. They're, they're coming out of the monastery, out of the convent, out of the special place into everywhere. When did you start exploring the mind-body connection? Because that seems to be underpinning a lot of your work there. You're working on the physiolo physiology as much as the psychology. <clears throat> yeah, because the, the research shows the physiology is changing rapidly. I'll just give you one example, one study, just kind of a, a very hopeful, very scary study. But um, I began to study the mind-body connection partly because I want to quantify things. So we researchers, well, we don't, don't want to know 
like, oh, oh, I felt happy after I meditated, after I used eco-meditation. We want to know how much happier. Were you 14% happier or were you 37% happier? We want to know. And so it came out of a desire not just to, um, to um, know these, these things worked, but know how much they worked and then compare them to other things that worked. I'll give you an example, drugs. You know, we, we use drugs for things like anxiety, depression, and PTSD. And drugs certainly have a role in severe depression, maybe in certain kinds of really severe anxiety. But research shows that psychotherapy works as well, if not better than drugs, and that energy therapies work remarkably in uh, studies of depression. So, so when you become interested in the, the mind-body connection and you measure it, you then can compare method A versus method B. Like we know that this vaccine works 97% effectively, this vaccine works 66% effectively. That's a really good metric to know. And you wanna know, does this meditation produce a 4% uh, improvement or 40% improvement? So you wanna quantify those. And just one study quantifying this looked at the development of beta amyloid plaques in the brain. And so, we know that in the brains of Alzheimer's patients and people with cognitive decline, they have an accumulation of beta amyloid plaques, which you can think of kind of like um, uh, gum or gunk building up on like on a pot or a pad used in your kitchen. If you don't wash it with detergent, then it starts to get a layer of buildup and that buildup becomes yucky and toxic. And so that's the same thing that happens to the brain. And we have these glial cells, the housekeepers of the brain that clean and sweep all that stuff away. And so in the study, they looked at the accumulation of Alzheimer's plaques in the brain and they did it in a non-invasive way. And there's certain very new scanners we can use. So it used to be you'd have to dissect the brain of a dead person to measure their beta amyloid plaques. Now we can just take a brain scan and we can, we can see whether those plaques are increasing. And with Alzheimer's, they get more and more and more plaques and eventually they start to shut down shuts down memory, learning, shuts down your kidney, shuts down regeneration, and you die. It's a horrible death. So they were measuring the amount of the accumulation of Alzheimer's plaques in the brains of these patients. And they looked at all the factors that were contributing to that. Smoking, obesity, lifestyle, diet, blah, blah, blah. They looked at a comprehensive group of factors that was influencing those beta amyloid plaques in the brain, those Alzheimer's plaques and their accumulation. And they found that one thing stood out as being the single most important factor. And that single factor was thinking, the mind-body connection. People who had more negative thinking had more beta amyloid Alzheimer's plaques. And those with the most negative thinking had the most beta amyloid plaques. So our thinking is literally driving functions in our body, like glial cell activity, like sweeping the brain free of these toxins. And that's just one study. I mean, there are thousands of studies showing it affects gene expression, it affects muscle mass, it affects telomere length, it affects stem cell production. All of these things be affected purely on the basis of our minds. And before we came live, I mentioned the, the one study of, of, of optimists showing that optimists live. People are just optimistic, cheerful about things. And that confers 10 years of additional longevity. You live 10 years longer than if you're a pessimist. I mean, that is just one little data point out of thousands of the benefits and of the power of using your mind and the changes it produces in your body. Did, did you look into how about conscious thinking, not necessarily positive or negative, just being conscious? Did you ever look into the, the effect that has on the, the physical body? That's what the studies of mindfulness essentially are. Mindfulness is living a conscious life. You are just on autopilot, just thinking the world is the way it is, your, your circumstances are the way they are. You're living consciously, you're eating consciously. Like I just finished a meditation retreat and each time I'd sit down to eat, I would re I'd bless my food and I'd tune into my food consciously. Mm. So um, that's positive in the sense that it's on the, 
rest and relax end of the spectrum. It's not on the fight or flight end of the spectrum. Negative thinking is, is the act of um, having your mind function as though there's a threat to your survival when there isn't. There's no tiger in the room, there's no lion chasing you, and yet your mental processes are imagining threats that aren't real. And when that happens, you have negative thinking, you're worried about a problem at work with your marriage, with your kid, with your body, what, with your money, whatever it might be. You're doing this negative thinking over and over and over again, and there's no real threat out there. So uh, positive thinking is infusing your mind with positive thoughts and consciousness, being conscious, is simply the act of eating and drinking and breathing and dressing and speaking to others with that perspective of being aware, being mindful. I'm, I'm really here, I'm really present now. I mentioned the default mode network earlier and the mid prefrontal cortex as being really active in depressed people. And when people are self-absorbed, self-reflective, obsessed with their own problems, that part of the brain is highly active. And that again, correlates to shorter lifespan, correlates to the buildup of unhealthy uh, byproducts called AGEs in your, your cells. All kinds of things happen when you're thinking in that negative way. When you're conscious, living a conscious life, breathing consciously, getting into compassion, thinking about, about you know, how shall, I, how, how shall I be? Like this last week, I I normally eat a really clean diet. I don't have a lot of uh, junk, junk food, I don't eat a lot of starches, things like that. But uh, last week I decided to splurge and I went and bought a huge, enormous pizza. <laughs> full of wheat, full of grease, full of, full of salt and, and cheese and all this other stuff. And I, I had a slice of pizza, really enjoyed it. And I just took the rest. I thought, you know, what, what's, what's the highest good now? I, I've had a slice of pizza. I've satisfied that little need to once every few months have a pizza. I thought, you know, I, there's some homeless people down at the harbor. I'm just gonna drive down there and share the pizza with them. So I did that. And, and you know, you just, you just, you're, you're just living, you're thinking things like, it's not all about me. What can I do? How can, what contribution can I make to the world? Giving a pizza to a bunch of homeless people is obviously a very modest and temporary contribution. But again, it's a consciousness, it's an awareness. I talk to my wife, when I talk to my wife, am I in my heart? Or am I in my head? Am I looking her in the eye? When I when I had when my kids were young, I have grandkids now. When my children were young, I would rather than I, I'm six foot six, so I two meters almost two meters tall. So rather than looming above them and talking down to them, I would sit down on the floor, look at my children eye to eye, and I really just talk to them as as as, uh, as valuable human beings. Our neighbor came over to us one day and said, you know, I've been living ne next door to you now for a couple of years, and I noticed that um, your kids never yell and scream, your kids are always you know, just really polite and nice, and, and uh, what's your secret? And I just said, well, I just listen to them. <laughs> they, 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 they don't have to yell and scream because they know that I'm going to sit down on the ground, look them in the eye, and really listen to them. They don't have to do crazy things to get heard. So living consciously, conscious parenting, conscious sex, conscious relationships, conscious use of money, like when you spend money. Like um, I used to have a collection of old cars, uh, classic sports cars, and then they all got burned up in a fire. And I thought after that, you know, I love my Rolls Royce. I love my Jensen Heaties. I love my old Fiat, but you know, what will be congruent with my values now is rather than buying a bunch more 50 year old gas guzzlers is buying an electric car. So I did that. So with your money, with your investments, you know what, when I invest money, I, I invest money in various things. What, what is congruent with my, my values? Like right now I've been investing in green energy companies because that, you know, I just looked at my portfolio today and I haven't made very much money on that, on that investment, but I feel really good about it too, because it, it, it's congruent. So you live consciously in your investments with your, your personal life, your business life, and you really monitor every part of yourself. You don't have to be a, a, a wild optimist or uh, you certainly don't need, don't need to become untethered from reality and say, try and be positive when things are already tough. You can be realistic, but again, you always are living that conscious life and it's a much better life and it does wonders for your body. 
And so now you mentioned the book also about the fire, uh, the fire that you went through when it burnt. Uh, like, what was the, what would be the key lesson you got from that? Looking back on it now, and I know there's probably a lot of lessons, but is there anything that stands out to you right now? Yeah, it was a, it was a profound set of lessons from the fire. We, we just, we woke up in the middle of the night. My wife woke me up. I looked at the alarm clock. It said 12.45 a.m. I looked out the window. There was a glow on the horizon. I walked out the door and looked at the glow. There was a wildfire racing down toward our valley. And I just yelled at my wife, we're getting out of here right now. We literally just sprinted for our car, the one car that didn't burn up, <laughs> which was a 2010 Honda. We knew it was start and run, whereas the Rolls Royce definitely was a, a, a very... Uh, <laughs> a very long shot about whether it would start the Fiat, the Italian car. It's always just an adventure with, with an old Fiat. It's like you turn the key, the car may start, the car may not, has a mind of its own. But we knew the, we knew the Honda would start, so we ran for the Honda, drove it out, the trees were all burning above our heads as we, as we, as we left. And in about two minutes, our whole house and our office and 5,000 houses were destroyed then. It was just a huge cataclysm. Suddenly 5,000 families were out of, you know, out of homes. Um, all these people were in shelters. There was no room for them to go. It was really uh, a, just a, 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 a really crazy time. We were very dislocated for the first few days. We were, we were I mean, you know, when, you, and then when we got photographs back from some friends who went by the house, two days later and it showed us the devastation there. I mean, the foundation was there, the chimney was there, but nothing else. And so over the next year, uh, we also had a lot of other problems. We, our office had been destroyed, our business tanked. So we lost all of our savings and then we lost all of our retirement savings. So by the end of the year, we lost all of our retirement and we were about $300,000 in debt. So uh, it was a very difficult year. And uh, I also had to have an operation. I'd been injured, off the fire, exerting myself too much. So was it easy? Fire, you know, losing all your savings, losing all your retirement funds, needing an operation during that, that year, was it easy? No. But I wrote a book during that year called This Brain, because I would meditate in the morning and I'd tune into the source of all that is, and I'd realize that, you know, that's there. And there's this image, one of the things that, um, was left when the office burned down was there's an image of this in the book and I'm getting goosebumps as I say this to you Dennis and um, so the office burned I mean the fire was so hot the cars burned the aluminum wheels melted uh, the filing cabinets melted the computers you couldn't even tell there'd been a computer there the desks melted everything melted but in this pile of ash that was left on top of the concrete slab where the office had been, there was one thing left. And that was, there was a, it was a ceramic statue of the Buddha and surrounded by the ashes, I'm looking at it right now, the corner of my, my office, surrounded by the ashes is about a foot high. This Buddha was just there in the ashes. And so I wrote a blog about that. And I talk about this in chapter one of my book, This Brain, I read a blog post I wrote and I said, you know, Compassion can't burn, love can't burn, hope can't burn, kindness can't burn, optimism can't burn. Right there in the middle of the ashes, the one thing that survives is the Buddha, the Christ being, the, the, the ultimate the, uh, core of who we are. All of those things cannot be affected by out of circumstances. So I was very surprised that even after the fire, I was still in this brain. I then began to dig into the neuropsychology of this. What's going on in the brains of people who are happy when they are in these dreadful situations? And it turns out there are all these happy neurochemicals you have and your brain has now been hardwired to be resilient. You've strengthened. I mean, if, if Graham Phillips, that TV host, could build up his emotional regulation circuit by 22.8% in only two months, imagine what doing meditation for eight, eight months, two years, 10 years, 20 years does. You are so resilient because all those brain circuits now, you've turned the software of your mind has turned those into the hardware of your brain. You are resilient. You are the Buddha in the ashes. You aren't affected by all these things. You feel them. I mean, you grieve the stuff you've lost. You grieve 22 people died. Eight people died within a thousand yards of our home. Did we grieve them? Absolutely. Did we shed tears? Yes. Was it a hard process? 
It definitely was. But we need therapy in addition to all the tools of self-help tools we, we used. Absolutely, we need therapy. But you have a sense of who you are that transcends all of the ups and downs of aging and death and money and all those things. And you know that fundamentally you're okay, the world's full of love, and you are that being of love and joy at your core. That's very, that's very well summed up, yeah. And yeah, there's this kind of indestructible thing within us, I guess, when you're tuning into that and you pay attention to the things then that can move you forward, process what you're going through. Uh, the other thing I'm curious about, though, is your your book. I read Bliss Brain. I enjoyed it. It's very detailed. I'd like to kind of get an insight into what's your process like for writing a book like that, where there's a lot of detail in the book. It's, it's a challenge because, Dennis, I have to read... Uh, there are about 400 citations in the book of studies that, that I read to extract that information. And the average person, you know, people don't use the, the good information there is there about health and happiness and well-being because it's, it's hard to find and it's hard to interpret. And some of those studies are really difficult to read, really difficult to even locate. And so as a science writer, I do that. I do the hard work. I read all of these things. I'll put a year or two years of my, of my life into that book. So I'm doing a huge amount. It's going to take you, you know, to read this brain, probably takes you know, 30 to 50 hours. So basically, you read it in a week, read it in a couple of weekends. Um, but that took a couple of years to, to write. But I try and make things simple. I try and find analogies that will make it easy to understand the science. And so if I do my job well as a science writer, all that hard, difficult science is really understandable. And then crucially, you can apply it in your life. Because what I wanna, there's just like today, I, I was, I'm on a summit today and I'm, I'm responding to comments and on the Facebook page and people are saying, I heard your talk and I'm gonna meditate every day from now on. So people are turning their inspiration into action. And that's what you have to learn to do. You have to both be inspired by all this stuff. And so my, my process is reading it all, trying to turn it into, into understandable information, but then inspiring people to take that step of spending that 22 minutes a day, download that meditation and then practice it. And that's when everything in your, in your life will start to change. Do you enjoy that challenge? Do you enjoy the process of trying to make something simple that is complex and there's a lot of research that goes into it? Sometimes. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's just a difficult uh, challenge and I uh, don't know how to do it and I'm baffled and I'm kind of... The, the creative process is partly sometimes very smooth and synchronistic. Other times you really have to work it. And so for me, it's... it's, it's uh, I'm reading difficult material. I'm struggling with how to translate it. I'm, I'm not happy with some of the, the, the explanations I come up with initially. I have to rewrite them. So uh, it's flow is um, there. There's the, um, the skills challenge ratio in flow. And my friend, Stephen Kotler talks about this a lot in his books. I talk about it a little bit in this brain. The skills challenge ratio means you have to be, if you're just doing the stuff you can do easily, if you're just mm. making eggs, fried eggs for the 5,000th time, there's no challenge there and there's no flow there necessarily. But if it's just a little bit more difficult, like there's actually a, a, a recipe for fried eggs that's a little bit different, I want to try soon. Now I'm going to be beyond my skill level. But if you get too far beyond your skill level, if it's 50% harder than your skill level, it's just frustrating. So you want mild frustration. You want a little bit of a challenge there, four, five, 6% higher than your existing skill level. If I'm writing about stuff I've already done, I've already thought about, that's easy. To put me in flow, to get to optimal states, you wanna be a little bit more challenged. So it's not totally easy. There's a little bit of frustration there that produces norepinephrine, one of those seven bliss brain chemicals, and you actually get bliss brain. So the frustration, for example, of being in monkey mind actually helps put you into bliss brain because you drop it, you feel like frustration, I'm not there yet. That squirt of norepinephrine is actually assisting you in getting into bliss brain. So it's, it, it's, 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 it's pleasurable and it's challenging at the same time. 
Is your meditation help you with that tension, that creative tension to actually, uh, I suppose, turn that frustration into forward momentum? I, I, I guess I find that it's the, uh, it's the upper end of things. Are you asking a question about something you don't fully understand? You're trying to understand that. Is that the, like, I guess what I'm most curious about is how do you get that sweet spot where it's not 50 percent too difficult <laughs> but it's also difficult enough that you're actually progressing because if you're doing the same thing over and over again you're not making any progress yeah how do you hit that sweet spot and you kind of know if you feel really stuck really frustrated that means you you've exceeded the skeleton's the skills challenge ratio and you're you're too far to your comfort zone if you feel mild frustration then you know and you can't ask for meditation too like i'm designing a new course right now and um part of it is really new i'm trying to do something and there's this big personal growth company called mind valley i'm doing a course for them i'm trying to do something in meditation in for the course that's never been done before and, and so it's it, it, it's it's hard um but it's also fun and challenging and if i do it then uh, millions of people will have breakthrough experiences. So I really want to see if I can get that, that, that right. Um, so what I'll do is I'll take the question into meditation. Mm -hmm. I, I won't know the answer. I'll say great universal source of wisdom, non-local mind, universe. I don't know. What do I do here? So I'll go into, into meditation baffled. And often I'll come out of meditation with an answer. Napoleon Hill talks about this in his book, Think and Grow Rich. He says that he's just baffled at the level of his ordinary thinking. He says you have to transcend ordinary thinking and he calls it his invisible counsel. He goes into this non-ordinary state of consciousness where he's communing and he has all of these um, beings on his invisible council, Marie Curie, George Washington, Abraham, all of these beings on his invisible council. So he, he takes this into that level of non-local mind, asks non-local mind questions, and then comes back to local reality with these answers. And he reads some of this stuff. I often read my own writing too after I've done that. But I read these answers, I read this material and I think, wow, I could never have come up with that at the level of local mind. But when you transcend local mind and inhabit non-local reality, there's all this wisdom there, all this love, all this insight there, which you then bring to solving the problems of your day and of your life. So take your questions into meditation. Now, don't make your meditation all about problem solving. You know, <laughs> the universe isn't supposed to be like this uh, uh, otherworldly concierge that's gonna deliver you everything you want. want it. It's not, not a waiter you put in your order. And <laughs> that's why my previous book isn't called Mind Over Matter, which I think is arrogant and foolish. It's mind to matter. It's how you join with non-local mind and then become a translator of non-local mind into local matter. So that's the way you wanna do it. Don't, don't treat the meditation period as, as, a, as a Q and A session with, yeah. uh, with the universe. But you certainly can bring your, your issues in there and you'll get a cadence, a layer of wisdom you don't get at the level of your local reality. That makes sense. Like a, a pull rather than a push. And it's, uh, I, yes. like I'll often ask a question. I'll just be stuck and then I'll pay attention for, I'll just pay attention. I'll just have my awareness. I'm going to pay attention to something different for the next, few, next while. Even you, you be on the podcast before I got the message from you. I was thinking about how do I get somebody who's into neuroscience on the podcast so we can talk about this in relation to what I'm talking about. So that again, wasn't uh, something I could make happen. It was something I put out there and things come your way sometimes. Yes. You put things out there and it's, it's amazing. There are lots of stories in my book, Mind to Matter, about people who just had ideas, had thoughts, you have a thought and suddenly it manifests. So um, there's, a, there's a lot of interesting science that links our thoughts to things around us and in many ways the book shows there are, are interesting scientific experiments showing we literally are able to affect molecules around us we're able to affect water molecules we're able to affect um, atomic level molecules photons electrons simply by our thoughts doesn't mean we can create stuff out of, out of thin air we're nudging the world in a certain direction with our thinking mm. Actually, when, when did you find yourself getting interested in the energy work? 
compared to we started off with the mind body and like when did you start seeing yourself being more drawn to understanding the metaphysical and the energy work i had one experience when i was in my uh early 20s and i learned energy healing when i was 15 16 years old so i practiced it a little bit and then um one day I was working on a construction site and we had nail guns and there are two kinds of nail guns. One shoots a really big, long, thick nail into uh, a stud, a big, large piece of wood. And the other is a finishing nailer and it shoots a skinny nail into uh, like putting up trim around a door or window. And there was an accident <clears throat> and the nailed trim nailer went through somebody's thumb. They nailed their thumb all the way through. So the nail went in the, um, in the thumbnail and out the ball of the mm -hmm. thumb. And then they pulled the thumb away and was bleeding profusely out of both ends. So I and a couple of other people just held our hands over the thumb and held that tissue in the intention of healing. And within a few minutes, <clears throat> the thumb swelled up, turned black and blue, looked very bruised. The black and blue went away, the bleeding stopped, both holes closed up, and he couldn't tell where the nail had been. And the whole thing took about 15 or 20 minutes. So I saw um, energy healing events like that. People just go through, have miraculous changes. I just heard from one of our nurses, because we have a certification program, we certify people in energy healing, and um, heard from one of our nurses that she has two Parkinson's patients. And Parkinson's is a, you know, it's an organic disease. It, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a progressive disease. It gets worse and worse and worse over time. And these two Parkinson's patients have gotten much better with energy healing. So I saw it early on as a, as a teenager. I've seen it up till recently. And energy is, has a remarkable ability to heal. People heal from cancer, people heal from heart disease, people heal from obesity, overeating, um, binge eating, they heal from all kinds of diseases. And we now know from epigenetic studies that it literally changes your genes. Certain genes turn on, certain genes turn off based on this. And there's again, quite a bit of research on exactly which genes turn on and off. I talk about those studies in my books. Mm. Uh, no, I, I'd be a believer in the energy, energy work also. It's a uh... I find it powerful, but again, it's one of those things that, well, from my experience, I can't make it happen. But if I am open and receptive to something, sometimes things happen that I can't account for, can't explain. I feel you can't explain them. You just and you you, you just trust and know that yeah. they will happen. Yeah, do you find um, do you find we're we're kind of shifting forward? I know in the past between science and faith and what and more religion, there was a bit of a well, it seemed to me that it was kind of a conflict that it didn't seem to be complementary in a way, that kind of faith side to things and that scientific side. Do you feel like that's progressing in society or where do you feel we're at with that? It's quite amazing to look at surveys of scientists and realize how many are mystics. Hmm. And uh, many of the great scientists like Albert Einstein talk about, in fact, Albert Einstein said that every great scientific breakthrough has been the result of a mystical experience. And so in science, you find a lot of people profoundly mystical. You know, we think of scientists as being rational materialists and very often they're, uh, they're, they're having extraordinary peak experiences, uh, mystical experiences as well. And so even physical scientists, chemists, physicists, math mathematicians, have those kinds of experiences. And then of course, we have different religions, they all look different, Hinduism looks different from Buddhism, looks different from Christianity, looks different from Islam. And yet the pinnacle of every religion is somebody or some group that had that same thing, a mystical experience. They then came down like Moses from Mount Sinai or Muhammad from his night journey, or they came down, something happened and they, they codified those and those became fossilized in the culture as the religion that then took shape, but its source was mystical experience. So both scientific breakthroughs and spiritual breakthroughs, personal breakthroughs, psychological breakthroughs are the result of this oneness with the divine. We suddenly, you know, we close our eyes 
and we we have a sense of union with the universe and suddenly we get insight we're walking through nature and we suddenly feel a sense of profound connection with the all that is when you work with the human body human healing uh, surgeons and people who who treat others you see miracles of healing the way the body heals i know i work a lot with people with ptsd especially war veterans and they're, they're having flashbacks they're having nightmares having intrusive thoughts and then they have a breakthrough and they just heal before your eyes one one young lady uh, i worked with and uh, she'd been sexually abused as a child and um had all the classic ptsd symptoms and then when we we, it was, it was, we i did a, a public session with her so as in front of a large audience doing this work with her on stage in front of every, everyone and she had a complete first of all breakdown then breakthrough and then she stood up and said i am strong i am powerful i am happy and nothing that man could do to me ever took away my joy so she turned her problem her abuse from a narrative of victimization and helplessness to a narrative of empowerment and looked at it from an adult perspective and so that kind of huge shift happens people heal even of dreadful abuse they heal of physical pain they heal of quote unquote incurable diseases it is amazing how much healing is available to all of us and we're living Dennis in only a tiny fraction of our potential far more healing is available than we realize and the the passion i have in my books is to let people know say your potential for healing is enormously greater than you've imagined and your potential as a human being to live your life with that oneness with nature oneness with the all that is and then live that inspired life is infinite so just meditate every morning use eft and other techniques to let go of your stress and you can have a much better life than you might have imagined yeah, i like that it covered a lot of ground there what's enough for me there was the codifying an insight i feel like that is i feel like that's probably how the the detailed scientific process can work with the fate and more kind of seeing something different that breakthrough uh, that's just kind of what stood out for me from listening to you there but anyway, thanks for, thanks for talking to us today, Dawson. Uh, where would people find you online if they wanted to work with you? Well, a number of places. And um, if you go to my website, Dawson, my name, and then the word gift, dawsongift.com, you can get a couple of really cool things. One is an immunity meditation. So we've shown that your immune system gets much stronger when you meditate in a certain way. So that, that immune meditation is at dawsongift.com and you get a couple, copy of Bliss Brain, go to blissbrain.com because the publisher has given us a huge number of books at cost, especially giving the book away free at blissbrain.com. You pay shipping and handling, but you can get the book at blissbrain.com. So blissbrain.com for the Bliss Brain book. And then for the immunity meditation, go to that website, dawsongift.com. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. And no, I'd recommend the book. I enjoyed reading it and I'll put the links in the show notes to the, to the meditation in the book. Um, you have a final message before we leave today, Ross? Enjoy yourself, love yourself, have a great life because uh, when we see people let go of all their suffering, we see them do that practice every day, link up with non-local mind, live in oneness with the universe. It just transforms everything, everything around you. You don't have to live as that sad 15 year old or sad, 85 year old anymore you can just have bliss brain and joy when you're in those mental states it reshapes your brain it reshapes your body and you're way happier and healthier you start to have the life you really want to have so i can just tell you it is a dramatic transformation it's available to everyone and that's what i encourage people to do do the practice be inspired but then do the practice meditate every morning use eft tapping to reduce your stress and then you'll see everything about your life will start to change perfect thanks Dawson that's a great message thanks again for taking your time out today I wish you all the best so thanks again for listening until next time have fun and enjoy the process <laughs>